Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Pro-abortion activists protest outside pro-life centers and the homes of Supreme Court justices. They gathered in front of the homes of Justices John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh over the weekend. A pro-abortion group is disrupting church services across the country, but a nonprofit law firm says they can be sued for that. Then we're prepared to bring lawsuits as necessary to protect people's exercise of their religious rights. A recently surfaced video shows Nina Jankowicz dismissing pushback against critical race theory. She's the newly appointed head of the Disinformation Governance Board at the DHS. Florida designates November 7th as Victims of Communism Day. Governor Ron DeSantis signs a bill requiring schools to observe the day and to teach the atrocities of communism. It's our responsibility to make sure people know about the atrocities. And troops, tanks, rockets and ballistic missiles. Russia's President Putin presides over a parade marking Europe's annual victory day. What clues could his speech offer about the future of the Ukraine war? We're starting off with some breaking news. Alabama fugitive Casey White and corrections officer Vicki White are in custody. That's according to the Lauderdale Sheriff's Office. Authorities say the two are hospitalized with injuries sustained in a chase. Their vehicle had crashed, after which they were taken into custody in Evansville, Indiana. And as the abortion debate continues, the U.S. Senate is expected to vote this week on a bill that would legalize abortion nationwide. And TD's Melina Weiskup has more on that and how voters are feeling about this issue leading up to the midterms. Democrats have ramped up their calls to take action in Congress to cement abortion laws. Uh, to vote for codifying Roe v. Wade. Uh, we are not giving up, we will never give in, and we will keep fighting. And if the American people are paying attention, this issue will also be on the ballot in November. And with midterm elections around the corner, will this issue be a top priority for voters? The issues that would affect my voting would be um, the economy just to make it and make sure I can provide for my family and have a home and um, education for my kids. Just two out of 21 people said abortion access is on their minds as they head to the polls. Uh, the next time I vote, one of the major issues that I'm considering is the um, reversal of the abortion ban. While many pro-abortion advocates say abortion is about women's rights, one woman says there's more to it. I've actually myself had abortions in my life. Um, that was during a very dark time in my life. Like all these people that are against the overturn of this, do they know? Have they had one? Do they know what it feels like? I don't think that they do. So I do support um, the overturn of the Roe v. Wade. The conservative majority court could overturn the ruling as early as next month. But congressional Democrats have another plan. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has teed up a vote for this Wednesday that would legalize abortion nationwide. And the vote on this measure this week will not pass because Senate Democrats do not have the 10 Republican votes needed in order to pass it. They're mainly using it as a way to force senators to go on record to show exactly where they stand on abortion rights. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And now the Senate is trying to ramp up security for the families of the justices. This as protests have erupted outside of conservative justices' homes over the past few days. Another protest outside of Justice Alito's home is planned for tonight. A new bipartisan bill would allow the Supreme Court police to provide around-the-clock protection to their family members. The bill is expected to pass as early as tonight. And the head of the newly established Disinformation Governance Board is coming under fire. This over comments she made about critical race theory. And TD's Grace Coulter has the details. 
A resurfaced video of disinformation czar Nina Jankowicz is adding to concerns over how she could regulate disinformation. In it, Jankowicz, who's been appointed to lead the controversial Disinformation Governance Board at DHS, dismisses pushback against critical race theory, or CRT. Critical race theory has become one of those hot-button issues that uh, the Republicans and, and other, you know, disinformers um, who are engaged in disinformation for profit, frankly, there are plenty of, you know, media outlets that are making money off of this too, have, have seized on. And I live in Virginia uh, and in Loudoun County, that's one of the areas um, where people have really honed in on this topic. Who pays your salary? Jankowicz is referring to Loudoun County School District. That's where parents have turned up at school board meetings in droves to protest racially divisive teachings linked to CRT. This is a, this is an Jankowicz went on to say CRT is no different than any of the other hot button issues that have allowed disinformation to flourish. Her comments are drawing outrage because curricula that mirror the tenets of critical race theory have been found in K-12 schools across the country. In many cases, it was parents themselves who found ideas such as white privilege and systemic racism in their children's curricula. As a solution to the so-called disinformation surrounding CRT, Jankowitz advocated for the expansion of government-funded media outlets like NPR and PBS. Grace Coulter, NTD News. Protests have erupted since a draft opinion revealing that the Supreme Court may overturn Roe v. Wade was leaked last Monday. This past weekend, pro-abortion activists turned up at pro-life pregnancy centers, churches, and the homes of the justices. Here are the details. Pro-abortion activists assembled outside the homes of Supreme Court Justices John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh Saturday night. Protesters yelled pro-abortion slogans and drew coat hangers on the pavement. It's not clear whether the justices or their families were home. Douglas Blair, a news producer for The Daily Signal, was on the scene. He said protesters' anger was much more intense outside Kavanaugh's house. Speaking with Fox News Monday, he called the protests an attempt at intimidation to change the justices' votes. Blair reports demonstrators dispersed only after several police cars showed up. The White House Monday addressed the protests and discouraged violence and threats of vandalism, saying judges must be able to do their jobs without concern for their personal safety. But many are criticizing the White House's response, saying it's too little too late. When a pro-abortion group posted the conservative Supreme Court justices' home addresses online last week and called for protests, the White House refused to condemn or discourage the move. Reporters asked about the president's position. So he doesn't care if they're protesting outside the Supreme Court or outside someone's private residence. I, I don't have an official U.S. government position on where people protest. I want it, we, we want it, of course, to be peaceful. The comments were criticized by numerous conservative lawmakers and commentators, accusing the White House of allowing justices to be intimidated and put at risk. And in Madison, Wisconsin over the weekend, a pro-life group's office was lit ablaze by a Molotov cocktail. Graffiti reading, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either, was also spray-painted on the outside of the Wisconsin Family Action Building. Police say the incident is being investigated as arson. A pro-life pregnancy center in Texas was also vandalized with pro-abortion graffiti. Two others were also targeted last week. Many pro-life advocates believe these attacks are being carried out by far-left activists. A nonprofit law firm Friday threatened to sue protesters who disrupt religious services. This comes after pro abortion organization Ruth Sent Us announced its intent to interrupt church services nationwide on Mother's Day. NTD's Arlene Richards has the story. Pro abortion group Ruth Sent Us is on a mission to protest churches across the country. Since the leaked Supreme Court decision that may overturn Roe v. Wade, the group has organized a number of protests targeting churches. The group said in a Twitter post that it is protesting churches to make sure people understand why Roe is falling. One of their plans was to disrupt religious services on Mother's Day at churches across the country. But a nonprofit law firm dedicated to religious liberty wasn't amused. The Thomas More Society sent a letter to the abortion activist group on Friday threatening to file a lawsuit. Attorney Charles Lamandry said for two years these kinds of attacks have been orchestrated against people of faith, and he thinks it's important for people to know what their rights are. If people disrupt a religious service, either the 
officials at the church or members of the church who are present who have their service disrupted can sue for an injunction to stop that type of activity from occurring in the future, as well as statutory damages or actual damages, as well as attorney's fees. After the Society's letter was published, Lady of Angels Cathedral in Los Angeles kicked out protesters, and Catholic men at St. Patrick's Old Cathedral in New York defended the church. LaMandry says this has to stop. And we're prepared to bring lawsuits as necessary to protect people's exercise of their religious rights. The Society offers its services free of charge. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill into law today requiring schools to observe Victims of Communism Day. Florida designates it as November 7th, the day the Bolsheviks installed the world's first communist regime in 1917. Here are the details. All right, so this is the Victims of Communism Day in law. The Florida law requires public schools across the state to observe Victims of Communism Day annually on November 7th and to teach students about genocides, famines, and persecutions under communist regimes. Governor Ron DeSantis explains what this law tries to achieve. We want to make sure that uh, every year uh, folks in Florida, but particularly our, our students, uh, will learn about the evils of communism, the dictators that have led communist regimes, and the hundreds of millions of individuals who suffered and continue to suffer under the weight of this discredited ideology. The Victims of Communism organization estimates that communist regimes have caused the deaths of at least 100 million people in 100 years. Most of that happened in communist China under Mao Zedong. We'll make sure that our students and, and people throughout uh, the state of Florida are reminded about the atrocities committed by Mao Zedong when he led communist China. He had tens of millions of people die because of the communist ideology. The Florida bill specifically names communist dictators Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Fidel Castro, and Pol Pot. The Florida governor reminds people that the new law is not just about remembering history. These Marxist ideas are not dead. Uh, they are, in many places right now, oppressing people such as in uh, communist China. And so when we're speaking the truth, it's not just for history. Uh, it's for what we're doing in the here and now. The bill passed the Florida House and Senate unanimously. Instruction on the horrors of communism will start during the 2023 to 2024 school year for students taking a U.S. government course. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. In an interview with the Financial Times, CIA Director William Burns said Chinese leadership is carefully weighing the Russia-Ukraine war. Burns says China has been struck by the ways in which Ukrainians have resisted Russian aggression. But he says China has not wavered in its determination to gain control over Taiwan. The CIA director says China wants to analyze the consequences of using force to gain control over Taiwan. Tensions between self-ruled Taiwan and Beijing have been escalating. China entered into Taiwan's air defense zone with fighter jets and bombers on May 6th. And Taiwan has responded. Russia marked the 77th anniversary of its victory over Nazi Germany. President Putin addressed a large military parade claiming that Russian soldiers are defending the motherland and the Donbass. In Moscow's Red Square on Monday, Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a speech at the country's Victory Day Parade. He repeated the narrative that justifies the invasion of Ukraine, citing what he calls external threats to split Russia. Preparations were openly underway for another punitive operation in Donbas and an invasion of our historic lands, including Crimea. Kiev has announced a possible acquisition of nuclear weapons. The NATO bloc began active military development of the territories adjacent to ours. This was an absolutely unacceptable threat systematically created for us and right on our borders. The Victory Day event is held on May 9th each year. It marks the anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. In his speech, Putin compared the conflict in Ukraine to Hitler's invasion under the Soviet Union. The Russian president greeted politicians and veterans at the ceremony. He also directly addressed soldiers fighting in the Donbas region of eastern Ukraine. Dear comrades, today the rebels of Donbas, together with the Russian army, are fighting on their own soil. 
You are fighting for the homeland, for its future, so that no one forgets the lessons of World War II, so that there is no place in the world for executioners, punishers, and Nazis. Putin also mentioned the loss of Russian troops, pledging to help the families of fallen soldiers. Following the parade, he paid tribute to war victims at a memorial by the Kremlin. On the same day of the event, Russian satellite TV was hacked. Menus were altered, with every channel showing anti-war slogans. One slogan said, you have the blood of thousands of Ukrainians and hundreds of their murdered children on your hands. Another said, the TV and the authorities are lying. No to war. Also marking the day, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the nation in a recorded video. He condemned Moscow for repeating the horrific crimes of the entire Hitler regime and said his country would win the war without ceding any territory. And joining us for a closer look at Russia's parade, Dr. Donald Jensen. He's the director for Russia and Europe at the United States Institute of Peace, which is a federal institution tasked with promoting conflict resolution and prevention worldwide. And Dr. Jensen is also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Donald Jensen, welcome. Thank you for having me. Putin's speech had been nervously anticipated for what he might declare about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What can we draw from his speech? Well, I, uh, people expected perhaps escalation, perhaps announcing part of Ukraine would be annexed, perhaps something else. But I think in large part, people were disappointed if they expected big news to come out of it. There was no mobilization of troops announced. Uh, and I thought personally that the mood was gloomy. He seemed defensive. There are a lot of staging of the event differences from the last couple of years, which was very interesting. He was much more alone. The other government members had a more secondary position. Uh, there was no chairman of the Russian military's general staff, Gerasimov. So there were a lot of interesting nuances there, which may not need any, mean anything. But on the other hand, they may indicate the amount of concern Russia has about the way things are going. And he also didn't formally declare war during his speech. Is that significant? It's significant in terms of mobilization. Russia needs more troops, even if they're badly trained and too young. And the issue of mobilization and declaring war are related. In order now, I think, to really win in Ukraine, he's going to need a lot more soldiers. And frankly, those are not really available readily. So a mobilization would have provided that legally. Not that that matters a lot to Putin. It would have provided more authority for cracking down at home, and it didn't happen. So it was a very interesting uh, speech, not with a lot of content, but the atmosphere was very in interesting and many things were noteworthy about it. All of which suggests a gloom, perhaps crisis in Moscow about what's going on. And when it comes down to it, why does this speech matter to the U.S.? It matters to the U.S. Uh, First of all, until he gave it, that this might announce a new Russian approach, new Russian initiative, new Russian uh, activism in the war. But this is also a snapshot. This is just like the Cold War in that you see Putin, people are wondering about his health, people are wondering about this and that, who sits where. People are wondering, frankly, why, why didn't the aircraft show up today? They said it was due to weather and there's no rain near Moscow at all. And as someone in Russian said, you can't have the whole country under a hurricane watch. So the fact that no plane showed up today is another clue to a very difficult problem, which is understanding what's going on in the Kremlin. And we'll take all the clues we can get, even if it's watching a parade that's essentially empty, which it was today. Dr. Jensen, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we hear from the former leader of Black Lives Matter amid questions about how the organization spent millions of dollars. And the greatest two minutes in sports saw the most betting ever at Churchill Downs. But how much of it was on long shot rich strike? That and much more coming up on NTD News. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American cars? 
Stephen Graves, thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here, so you are in the know. One of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter is denying wrongdoing. The last 11 months have been turbulent for the former leader of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors. She faced a barrage of questions about how BLM Global Network Foundation spent tens of millions of dollars. And not only that, but concerns that she personally benefited as a prominent voice in the group. In one case, the Indiana Attorney General filed a lawsuit against a BLM charity for failing to disclose its financial information. NTD's Kevin Hogan has Colors Defense and more. You know, the idea that Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation received millions of dollars and then I hid those dollars in my bank account is absolutely false. That's a false narrative. Colors admitted that she made mistakes and lost trust during her six years guiding the foundation, but the activist denied she ever wrongfully used donations meant to help black people. At issue is the foundation's reported purchase in 2020 of a compound in L.A. for $6 million. Colors addressed this as well. We looked at commercial buildings, we looked at, you know, homes, and then we found this really amazing space that's a sweet space spot between commercial and residential that has office spaces, that has parking, that has, yes, a home on the property, but also has a sound stage where you could do podcasts and you could do uh, live events in the backyard. The property is in the Studio City neighborhood of Los Angeles. It includes a home with six beds and six baths, a swimming pool, as well as a sound stage. The property is meant to be a meeting place and a campus for a fellowship of black artists. Colors addressed concerns that she was hiring her family to work on the property. I think it's important that people understand that while my brother is the head of security and my mom and sister did work at the property, there are also dozens of other people who work in the organization um, that are black folks and are doing amazing work. It's not like I literally opened up the bank accounts and was like, I'm bringing all my family and friends in. Folks had skill sets. BLM raised $90 million in 2020 after protests over the death of George Floyd, but the organization drew criticism after the announcement. That was over who had access to the donor funds. Local chapters and others also called for more transparency about the foundation. One of the biggest tourist destinations in the world took over Times Square today in an effort to attract New Yorkers and visitor visitors alike back to its city. NTD's Phil Zoe has more from Times Square. We're in the heart of Times Square, but doesn't the scene behind me look like we're in London? Especially with this black iconic taxi. That's because we're at the event London Times Square Takeover. Our message to Americans is, uh, London is open, let's do London. Where we have just launched the biggest invitation to London that the world has ever seen. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, is launching a $10 million tourism campaign to attract visitors back to his city. I asked Mr. Khan why he decided to make New York City his first stop. From the East Coast, the West Coast, what we really want is Americans to re-experience the city they uh, love. We've got great connections with uh, New York. We're kindred spirits. We're both global cities. And the London mayor came prepared. Uh, the Queen's let me borrow some of her Coldstream cars. They'll be here uh, today to get a taster, a vignette of what London has to offer. But also we've got world-class theatre in the West End. Uh, you'll see in a moment the fantastic uh, musical Six uh, award winning already, nominated today for eight Tony Awards. Laura Citrin is the CEO of London and Partners. She's leading the Let's Do London campaign. For tourists from around the world, you don't need to fill in a form, you don't need to take a test, just come on, visit us. We have over 100 flights a day. Citrin told me visitors will be delighted to know London is one of the greenest cities on the planet. You can come to London, wake up in the morning, go for a long run or a cycle in one of our beautiful parks. Some of them even have wild deer and then just head straight into the city. Earlier in the day, New York's mayor welcomed Mr. Khan to the Big Apple. London's economy lost over $7 billion in 2020 because of pandemic travel restrictions. This is the first time Mr. Khan has visited the U.S. since 2016. He'll be traveling to the West Coast before returning to London. Phil Zhou, NTD News, Times Square. 
And now for your sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. In the NBA tonight, a pair of game fours are on the schedule. First, Milwaukee looks to take a 3-1 lead against Boston. Giannis Adarukumbo has dominated this series to the tune of 31 points and 11 rebounds a game as the Celtics have no one to match up against him. His output has helped make up for the loss of all-star Chris Middleton, who isn't expected back until the conference finals. Boston was able to get Marcus Smart back from injury Saturday, but the NBA's Defensive Player of the Year missed seven of his eight shots on the night. In a late matchup, the Grizzlies will look to tie their series up at two against the Warriors, but without the services of emerging star John Morant. Morant suffered a knee injury in their loss Saturday. Recently named the league's most improved player, the 22-year-old has averaged 38 points in the series. Memphis somehow, though, won 20 of 25 regular season games without him. To win tonight, though, the Grizzlies will have to slow down Golden State's Jordan Poole, who's continued his torrid postseason shooting hitting just under 50% of his three-point attempts. In other NBA news, ESPN is reporting that Nuggets center Nikola Jokic will win his second straight MVP award after finishing among the top 10 leaders in points, rebounds, and assists. Jokic is the 15th player to win multiple MVPs and second straight to do so following Giannis Adelokounmpo. In the NHL, four more games are on the schedule tonight as Washington, Pittsburgh, and Dallas all look to take commanding 3-1 leads while Colorado looks to sweep Nashville. The Avalanche may have their top goalie Darcy Kemper back tonight after he was hit in the eye by a stick in Game 3. Nashville, meanwhile, is still without their top goalie, Yusa Saros, who has what's been termed a lower body injury and is yet to play in the series. Saros actually led the NHL with 67 starts in the regular season. In other NHL news, the Islanders have fired head coach Barry Trotz after the team missed the playoffs for the first time since 2018. Trotz was their head coach the past four seasons and was even named Coach of the Year in 2019. This past weekend's Kentucky Derby was the most heavily bet derby in the 148-year history of the event with a reported $179 million changing hands. Of that, though, just over half a million was bet on the eventual winner, Rich Strike, who at 80 to 1 odds was the second biggest long shot to ever win at Churchill Downs. The Colt wasn't even in the Derby until Friday after a late scratch. In baseball, Mets ace Max Scherzer took the loss Sunday after pitching six innings and giving up three runs as the Phillies topped the Mets 3 2. The loss was Scherzer's first since last May, a period of 343 days. Scherzer had gone 24 starts in a row without one, the sixth longest streak in the modern era, in a period that spanned his time with three different teams, the Nationals, Dodgers, and Mets. Scherzer, who's won three Cy Young Awards, hadn't lost since May 30 of 2021 when he gave up a paltry two runs in six innings of work against Milwaukee. That's all for sports today. Back to you, Steph. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic.
low-income households, the White House today announced a partnership with Internet providers to lower the cost of Internet. NTD Steve Lance has more. Twenty Internet providers have committed to the program. The administration says the plan will increase access to high-speed Internet for 48 million households around the country. High-speed Internet is not a luxury any longer. It's a necessity. Internet service fees for eligible families will be reduced by up to $30 a month through grant funding. And some won't have to pay at all. And if, if you qualify, you're going to get a $30 credit per month toward your Internet bill, which meets, which most folks will mean they get on for nothing. Look, zero. As of 2018, about 85 percent of American households had access to broadband Internet. California lawmakers are still pushing for new COVID-19 vaccine laws, but that's just a jumping off point. State legislators advanced a bill that would allow minors to get any vaccine without parental consent. NTD's Cynthia Kai has more. California is one step closer to allowing minors to receive any vaccine without parental consent. The Senate Judiciary Committee moved Senate Bill 866 forward on May 5th in a 7-0 to zero vote, with four abstaining. One million California teenagers are unvaccinated for COVID. Having a large number of unvaccinated teens undermines public health and increases the risk of infection, hospitalization, and death for those kids, but also for others around them. Senators Scott Weiner and Richard Pan authored SB 866. The bill would allow minors 12 years and older to sidestep parental consent and receive FDA-approved vaccines. According to the bill analysis, the legislation is intended to be a resource to minors whose parents are too busy and unable to take them to receive a vaccine due to lack of paid time off or even medical neglect. Meanwhile, the Catholic Families for Freedom, California, wrote in opposition to the bill. The organization wrote, Teens lack the necessary maturity to make sound medical decisions and are generally more vulnerable to coercion than adults. And if parents are not aware that their children has recently received a vaccine, their ability to properly monitor that child for any side effects is hampered and may cause a delay in timely treatment. SB 866 survives several other COVID-19 related bills that were paused by their authors. This includes SB 871, which would have required all K-12 students to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Senator Richard Pan pulled his bill earlier last month. However, SB 866 is expected to be heard in more committees at a later date. Over the weekend in San Francisco, people gathered to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the introduction of a meditation practice popular all over the world. And people paraded through the city afterwards. Here's NTD's Jason Blair with more. It's the 30th anniversary since the practice of Falun Dafa was first introduced to the public. Bay Area practitioners gather in San Francisco to celebrate. Hundreds of people gathered at San Francisco's Ferry Building for the celebration. One attendee named Manny Gonzalez started practicing Falun Dafa, also known as Falun Gong, in August 2020. I came upon some information uh, that was put out by the, you know, they said bad things about DAFA. And I mean, I later found out those, those websites were put up by the Communist Party of, you know, the Communist government. That information that Gonzalez saw came from the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The CCP has actively persecuted, harmed, and killed people inside China for believing in Falun DAFA since 1999. But Gonzalez decided to investigate for himself. I read John Fallen for, and then I realized like, wait, this is nothing like what they're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good practice and I want to start learning it. So I started learning the exercises and reading the book and uh, I've been practicing ever since. Falun Dafa practitioners work to adhere to be better people in daily life. One way is by following the principles of truthfulness, compassion and forbearance. Gonzalez, who traveled from Southern California for the event, said those principles changed him from an angry and resentful person to someone who is kind and goes with the flow. You know, every time I, I do anything now, 
you know, whether it's in work or my personal life, I always reflect back on it now and I really realize what can I do better and what can I, how can I be more kind and how can I be, you know, uh, a better person. Linda Campbell, another Falun Gong practitioner from North Bay, has been practicing for 14 years. She said she used to get colds and flus often, but all that changed after taking up the practice in sincerity. I look at it as a time of just gratitude and a time to just remember how wonderful it is that he brought this ancient practice to the public so that we could all benefit from it. The parade embarked around noon to celebrate the day and raise public awareness. Many onlookers stopped to watch and appreciated the colors and messages of the banners. I think it's a very happy event and I love music, I love bands, so I can't think of a better way to express your joy and your principles but through music. It's all about truthfulness, mindfulness and uh, all about compassion, yeah, and looking after your like fellow person and sort of stuff. and sort of just spiritually calming yourself down. This is something that's on a much broader scale and because, like you said, it is a matter of how it really impacts China and just the Chinese community at large, it just has me kind of fascinated. I think that we should take stronger action to support the rights of people to have religious freedom in China and everything I understand about Falun Gong is that it's a very peaceful religion it focuses on benevolence. I feel that we need to spread that word about what's happening so that people are aware and that demonstration can be peaceful. And the parade went through downtown San Francisco and ended up here in Chinatown. The festivities continue next week in San Francisco. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. Coming up on Mother's Day in Shanghai, Chinese authorities forcibly separate a mother from her son. This as parts of the city tighten virus restrictions. And France's President Macron was inaugurated for a second time on the weekend. Though he comfortably won the election, he may face increasing social unrest from sections of the population. That and more in just a moment here on NTD News. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. At least 35 people have died, 89 were injured, and 20 remain hospitalized after a huge explosion on Friday destroyed the Hotel Saratoga in Havana, Cuba. That's according to a statement from the country's health ministry. Among the dead are four minors, a pregnant woman, and a Spanish citizen, according to the statement. Officials said Friday they believe a gas leak may have caused the blast at the hotel. Rescue workers say they think more victims may still be buried in the rubble. And on Mother's Day in China, a Shanghai mother was forcibly separated from her son and taken into a quarantine facility. This as Shanghai authorities tighten pandemic re prevention measures in parts of the city. NTD's Don Ma has the story. Authorities in Shanghai are again tightening virus restrictions, just as the city was emerging from a month-long lockdown. Notices issued to several districts declared that a complete lockdown will begin Monday. Residents are forbidden to leave home even to go buy food. Authorities are also halting courier services. All non-essential deliveries will be suspended. As authorities announced lockdowns, they're also forcibly dragging Shanghai residents to quarantine facilities. Here's a clip. This happened over the weekend on Mother's Day. The woman is forcibly separated from her son and taken to a quarantine facility. The scene here is a rare sight in the West, but in China, it's commonplace. Here's another person being forcibly taken to a quarantine facility. So why are Chinese authorities doing this? 
Erping Zhang, Edward Mason Fellow at Harvard University and YouTube host of Tea with Erping, says it's because of Xi Jinping's decree of eliminating every virus case in China. The zero COVID policy comes from Beijing and from the Communist Party decision maker Xi Jinping. So the lower level officials must follow the decrees, otherwise they'll lose, lose their jobs. <laughs> The responsibility of eliminating virus cases is passed down to local officials, and these officials have to report their results to their bosses. The local officials, their primary concern is to report to their boss. They have zero cases in their uh, uh, districts or cities or neighborhoods. Um, they don't care the suffering uh, for the sufferings of the, uh, the people, residents. The reason why Chinese officials don't care about people's suffering is due to China's political system. In China, these officials are not voted into office by the residents or citizens or their people in their district or cities. They are handpicked by the Communist Party, so that's why they only report to their boss. They don't have to report to the residents or the masses. Any hopes that China will move away from its zero COVID policy were dashed, as Xi Jinping last Thursday told Chinese officials in an important meeting to unswervingly follow the policy. Don Ma, NTD News. The election for Hong Kong's next leader took place on Sunday, and the city's former security chief won by a landslide with more than 99% of the vote. But was he really that popular? And what can we expect from this Beijing-backed candidate? NTD's Chenny Wu has the story. An election committee on Sunday voted in a secret ballot for Hong Kong's next chief executive. And it comes as no surprise that former security chief John Lee was elected, especially since he was the only candidate. The election follows major changes last year to Hong Kong's electoral laws that ensure only so-called patriots to Beijing can hold office. The European Union called the election another step in the dismantling of the one country, two systems principle. In response to critics, China's foreign ministry said the election was conducted in a fair, just and orderly manner in accordance with laws and regulations, adding that it proves that the new electoral system is a good system. So what can we expect from Hong Kong's next leader? Back in 2019, Lee led the crackdown on the city's massive pro-democracy protests while serving as security minister. Under Lee, police unleashed a heavy response, including mass arrests and using brutal methods such as tear gas and rubber bullets against protesters. He was also a key figure in pushing for a proposed extradition bill that would have sent Hong Kong suspects to mainland China, where courts operate under the ruling Communist Party. Lee will replace current leader Carrie Lam on July 1st. Her five-year term was marked by pro-democracy protests calling for her resignation, a security crackdown that suppressed all dissent, and the recent COVID-19 wave that overwhelmed the health system, events that have undermined Hong Kong's reputation as an international business hub with Western-style freedoms. Former legislative councillor Ted Hui worked with Li in the past. He predicts that Beijing's endorsement of Li signals the central government is looking for someone reliable to ensure that its authority in Hong Kong is never questioned again. He seldom spoke. And, and when, whenever he spoke, he was just read from the script. He doesn't have a character of uh, his own. Hui says Beijing doesn't want a capable leader, but one that does its bidding. Beijing only wants uh, someone who is uh, extremely loyal and extremely good at executing orders. Hui says he expects more human rights abuses, brutal crackdowns and severe laws to come under the new leadership. Under the new electoral rules, Li was the only candidate who received backing by Beijing. Several people, including a movie producer, had expressed interest in running but didn't submit their names during the nomination process. Chenny Wu, NTD News. In a country where presidents are rarely re-elected, Emmanuel Macron is about to begin his second term as French president. During his inauguration in front of a crowd of politicians, religious leaders and other state figures, he promised to lead with what he called a new method. 
But on the streets, some French expressed concern. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has the story. Emmanuel Macron was sworn in for his second term as French president on Saturday at the Elysee Palace in Paris. Cette confiance. This trust, always fragile, challenged every morning, is the base of our liberty system. Every day in the openly mandate, I will only have one compass to serve. Among the 500 guests present at the ceremony were former presidents François Hollande and Nicolas Sarkozy, as well as former prime ministers, religious leaders and other state figures. The day before Macron's inauguration, some French appeared worried over his second term. The French already have a purchasing power problem. Some are having trouble feeding themselves, so I fear there could be a new Yellow Vests crisis. Macron's first term was overshadowed by the Yellow Vest protest movement, which was largely fueled by rising fuel prices. I am expecting a social crisis that would be significantly more important than the previous one. I think he lies to the public. Macron promised to lead with what he called a new method and to build a stronger France. He is the first leader in 20 years to serve a second term. To implement measures from his program, Macron would need to keep a majority in the June parliamentary elections. But a new alliance of left-wing parties is trying to beat Macron's party. We are putting in place an act of collective resistance against the social, ecological and the democratic abuse of a leader who gets elected by default. Macron's second mandate will officially start this Saturday. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, a cache of 19 cannons thought to have been lost since the Revolutionary War were accidentally discovered in the Savannah River. They're now being restored, and historians believe they were once carried on British ships. And the biggest movie debut of 2022 so far. Ticket sales for Doctor Strange 2 beat expectations over the weekend. More in just a moment here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium My Pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all My Pillow products. A warehouse along the Savannah River is holding British historical treasures that were found in a riverbed last year. Evidence suggests the finds were lost for more than 240 years. A cache of 19 cannons suspected to be from British ships scuttled to the river bottom during the American Revolution. NTD's Anna Rodriguez has more. 19 mud and rust-encrusted guns were discovered in the Savannah River by accident. A dredge scooping sediment from the riverbed last year surfaced with one of the cannons clasped in its metal jaws. The crew soon dug up two more. Uh, we were very surprised by the discovery. We were using a clamshell dredge in this reach of the Savannah River because it was near the location of the CSS Georgia, which was a Civil War ironclad that was scuttled um, to protect Savannah. Archaeologists initially guessed that they were relics from a sunken Confederate gunship excavated a few years earlier in the same area. But experts for the U.S. Navy found they didn't match any known cannons used in the Civil War. Further research indicates they are likely almost a century older and sunk during the build-up to the Revolutionary War's bloody siege of Savannah in 1779. 
Commodore Philip Nash of the British Royal Navy, a military attaché based in Washington, visited the warehouse to view the artifacts. It's always surprising that these things turn up, but, uh, but I guess given the amount of, um, of history uh, that there is in a place like this, uh, maybe we shouldn't be surprised. Now officials with the US and British government, as well as the state of Georgia, are working to preserve the newly found guns before putting them on display. In this day and age to find so many Revolutionary War artifacts for a site that we thought was missing in the Savannah River and that nothing was left from it, you know, to be able to actually identify these is remarkable. The cannons are being kept in water to prevent further deterioration until experts can carefully clean them. Meanwhile, researchers are looking for more definitive proof linking the cannons to British ships from the American Revolution. Anna Rodriguez, NTD News. Over the weekend, Doctor Strange 2 had the 11th biggest opening in domestic box office history. This is great news for the theater industry that's still trying to get business back to normal after the pandemic. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. Wanda, what do you know about the multiverse? Had his theories. He believed it was dangerous. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness beat expectations, making $185 million in ticket sales in North American theaters over the weekend. And worldwide, the movie has already made $450 million, which makes for the biggest movie debut of 2022. <laughs> In the film, Doctor Strange, who used to be a neurosurgeon, battles evil forces across parallel universes. <sighs> Elizabeth Olsen stars in the movie as Scarlet Witch. I do feel like it's it's just a great continuation. I've really loved being a part of this family. But you don't get to do this that often in this job, get to be with a character for eight years. And so it's it's been an incredible journey. This is our home. The next fight for it. Olsen also plays in the TV miniseries, WandaVision, which some recommend watching to have a better understanding of Doctor Strange 2. Everything you've ever known. The movie, which reportedly cost around $200 million to make, will not likely play in China, Russia, or Ukraine. But repeat viewings will likely push revenue past the $1 billion mark. Here we go. In three, two, one. One of the next big summer movies coming out soon will be Top Gun Maverick, which comes out on May 27th. What the hell? Good morning, aviators. Jason Perry, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.